three, two, one. Buckle your seatbelt. Batten down the hatches. Coming to you live from the Blazer Podcast Studios in Space City, Texas. It's time once again for the Capital Catalyst Show. The podcast for entrepreneurs to learn the secrets of attracting, raising, and closing capital from high net worth investors. Dedicated to your success, this is the Capital Catalyst Show. Now here's your host, Brad Blazer. Hey, listeners, welcome back. It's Brad Blazer once again, the host of the number one podcast when it comes to teaching and empowering people on how to attract and how to raise capital, the Capital Catalyst Show. We are here today with two phenomenal individuals that have a track record in real estate, but more importantly, they've also worked with investors and they're getting ready to do big things in life. As I like to say, the reason we do what we do is so that you can attract investors to build by scale a business or simply do something bigger in life. So today we have Harrison Bonner and Alex Ricola. I'd like to welcome you both to our show. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Doing well. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Brad. You bet. It's great to host people. You know, normally we host just an individual. Here we get the pleasure of actually speaking to two. So it's going to be a special session today for well, sure. We'll find out at the end if it was a pleasure to have both of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I always love to do when we get started on any show or any episode is really get the backstory of how you two number one met. And then how you ultimately came together to start this great company that's doing big things in real estate. So either one of you want to take the reins and maybe share that today? Sure, Harrison, if you don't mind. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, I like my version of it better anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Um, But uh, yeah, we, uh, Alex and I uh, knew each other in our college years. So now this is dating back to 2013, which is, you know, over 10 years ago now. Uh, we got started in a, um, a a college entrepreneurship program called Student Painters, uh, also known as Young Entrepreneurs Across America. Uh, we were both, I think I was 21 at the time. I guess Alex probably was right around that age. And we were just kind of hungry for something a little different in our college experience. Uh, and this program was marketed as be your own boss, learn to run your own business. Um, it was a it turned out to be a great opportunity for both of us. Um, we actually went to separate universities but we're part of the same larger division. Um, So we found some success individually in that company and then eventually uh, rose through, you know, sort of some of the junior ranks to uh, like an executive level position where we would hire and train other entrepreneurs and mentor them for sort of the following year. Um, Really great experience uh, in student painters for, I think I did it for three years and Alex did it for four. Uh, Mm -hmm. But we grew, uh, we did one year of that full-time after college in uh, 2014 was when we both graduated from school. Uh, That company moved, um, Alex uh, moved with that company or or actually Alex, the way he tells it is he chose, he wanted to move to Boston. He was moving there with or without them, which I believe to be true. Uh, (laughs) I wasn't part of that at the time, Um, but he signed uh, a lease on an apartment he never saw in person and moved up to Boston. Uh, and um, and was the full time general manager and started the New England division of student painters uh, in mm-hmm. the area at that time. So I I remain a general manager in more of the North Carolina region, which is where we were originally from, uh, the Carolina, the North and South Carolina area, and uh, we continue to work in that company for a year out of school. And because you sort of decide year over year whether or not you want to renew your contract and work on another year. We ended up leaving the company at the same time and had uh, sort of discussed what our next business opportunities were. Gotcha. Uh, Alex had decided he was going to start a real estate business. Uh, it had been on my mind as well. And I, I spent a little bit of time traveling uh, for a couple months. But in January of 2016, I moved into a spare bedroom and um, the first house sack uh, deal of the business. <laughs> and uh, we just started door knocking um uh, we started door knocking pre foreclosures for short sales, so that was our that was our um, sort of journey into the real estate space. Uh, that was in 2016. January 2016 was the first time I ever knocked on a door, basically asking if I could buy their house. <laughs> wow, unbelievable story! You know, it's funny how people get started. You guys were door knockers. I was a bandit sign ninja, banging those little signs on the telephone poles and 
posting them on street corners and, you know, had a magnet that went on the side of my car that said, we will buy your house with my telephone number. And here's the funny thing. That shit works. It does. <laughs> right? it, it does uh, work. It really does. Um, as you guys were getting started, uh, because this will probably resonate to many of our listeners, what were some of the maybe problems that you both faced or maybe some of the struggles that you went through? And more importantly, maybe how did you work together as a team to overcome them? <clears throat> yeah, sure. I think I think um, I think probably the biggest challenge that we came to encounter was really after our first project, Harrison and I. We got our, we, we purchased our seventh transaction together because our, our wholesale buyer fell through the week before closing. And we were so excited to make $20,000 on this wholesale fee. Um, and I had negotiated the short sale personally, and all of this was disclosed to the bank. And I said, hey, we lost our buyer. Um, but, you know, Harrison had a little bit of a nest egg. It was a single family home, 2,400 square feet for $91,000. If you can imagine that in the eastern side of Massachusetts. <laughs> We, negoti we negotiated that deal 30 minutes outside of Boston. Harrison had enough of a nest egg to buy it. So I said, hey, could you give us, a, could you give us a, um, an extension? I'll waive my commission. I'd like to try and buy this building. And uh, they let us buy it. And we actually had a 70% <laughs> return on our investment in seven months. And we, had, we probably arguably got way too much confidence on our first transaction. But that confidence led us to effectively scale to about $6.4 million worth of development in our first 18 months. And it was through that experience where we really found out how hard uh, and important that your team of contractors is uh, yeah. and really how you can buy it right, you can sell it right, but it's that space in the middle is where you can really lose a lot of money or, or get beat up along the way. So after we, after we sold what we considered our hell portfolio, uh, we went back to, uh, you know, lower end neighborhoods to kind of rebuild our business. And it was at that point in our career, we got Harrison licensed as a general contractor here in the state of Massachusetts. We set up a sister entity, we got insurance, and then we started pulling our own permits and overseeing mm -hmm. our own subcontractors on a bit of a, a more simple execution. And then, you know, that was Harrison, I guess that was 2018, early 18. 2019. Yeah. And uh, from there, we effectively just through experience and a bit of trial by fire learned on the job site in a safer way. And then we've now scaled that to uh, effectively a $28 million portfolio of uh, apartments, multifamily housing that we're developing with the long term intention to keep. That is great. You know, you brought up a really good point kind of early in that comment, and that is. You got to know your contractors. You got to know the people that you're working with that are part of your team. I think any one of us that have ever been involved in real estate maybe have had that experience where you have a contractor, maybe a painter or someone that shows up and says, you know, hey, uh, I need some upfront money to go get my materials or something similar to that. And then you never see them again or <laughs> they show up uh, and they do a half ass job and they don't finish and, you know, then they ghost you. Uh, and so it's really important for everybody that's listening to this, that's getting into real estate, maybe for the first time or wants to get in, you know, ask for references, you know, check people out, make sure they're legit. And more importantly, if a contractor is asking you for money up front before they really get started on the job, you might want to question that because, quote, credible contractors should have enough of a cushion or at least enough money to go out and get the supplies and things they need to work on your property or work on your home. If they're just getting by check to check, uh, it should tell you something, number one about them, but more importantly, maybe the quality of work or taking on that risk that, you know, that money's gonna go to beer and party in and they may never show up. And they don't even, they don't even share started. the beer. They don't even yeah. share that <laughs> beer with you. Yeah, but I've seen, I've seen horror stories and more importantly, I've read horror stories in many of the RIAs that I'm active in where, uh, you know, this has happened to people. And uh, as the Latin phrase says, you know, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Uh, you need to do your homework, especially in real estate, because it is a business that does require capital in order to invest, rehab, renovate, whatever uh, down payments to be successful. Um, when you guys started doing this, because the first property that you basically flipped was largely financed and purchased with Harrison's nest egg, as you kind of had explained here. 
when did you both realize that you needed to bring some investor capital to the table? And more importantly, uh, when you got started working with investors, was it largely just friends and family or how did you build that network? Yeah. Harrison, would uh, you like to good say this? This is your next Yeah, I, I would honestly say that on the very first project, we realized we we're going to have to raise outside capital because uh, if you remember, we actually did have to go out and raise an extra 30 grand at the end to finish mm -hmm. the, the project. By nest egg, it wasn't nearly enough to purchase the whole property, but <laughs> it got us in with the hard, it was enough to get us in with the hard money lender. Uh, and, you know, we bought it for 90, sold it for 350. So there was, you know, plenty of rehab room in there. Uh, but yeah, we had to go out and raise um, 30,000 to wrap up the construction because we were short on our construction funds from the hard money lender. And um, uh, that was, you know, that was our first exposure to like, wow, you you really have to have capital to operate this business efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and you obviously have to know your numbers well enough to know what you um, what you can comfortably raise. Uh, to, you know, to operate profitably. Right. So, um, you know, we, we had exposure to that on the very first deal and we, we sort of knew that that was going to be a part of the business. Um, but we very quickly went from one project to then seven all raised with outside capital. Mm. Um, so that was, you know, that really catapulted us at that time. And then we, you know, as out said before, we sort of, we eventually pulled back, but we were always we were always raising money from from there on out. Gotcha. What what have you both learned from this process of raising capital, getting involved in bigger deals um, that maybe you wish you had known when you were both just getting started? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think in the beginning, especially when you're smaller, uh, raising capital on a one-off basis, um, when you have a, a smaller amount of irons in the fire, it's, it's a bit easier to conceptually manage. You don't need an incredible amount of systems as a small operator. Uh, really what we've, you know, what we've experienced is, you know, one-off projects have been great. They've been our bread and butter for the last eight years. But as we've scaled into a bit of a longer, uh, longer term outlook, and we've gotten into bigger projects, you know, we've raised capital across 50 private investors. And, uh, you know, that can be more challenging because now instead of, you know, uh, coaxing and holding the hands of, you know, eight larger capital investors that are a bit more experienced, they understand mm -hmm. Uh, it's a, it's scary to not to not know what you don't know, and a lot of people have been burned in other scenarios. So when right. you have to juggle all these individual relationships, you can spend more time uh, making sure the relationship is healthy or trying to adjust timelines based on uh, portfolio benchmarks on when you're going to realize that equity repay people. And if and if they don't understand that, um, we've we've experienced that as a bit of a challenge. And one of the reasons we're so excited to to join this program is ultimately so we can, you know, reallocate our capital stack with uh, new money that is a bit more understanding of the process and the model that we're really working to build. You have to educate your consumer. Um, but at the end of the day, we've been chasing $50,000 checks on average. Uh, and it's just a different type of investor at that level compared to somebody who's cutting checks in the, the quarter of a million to half a million dollar range. That's probably been, you know, managing all of those expectations, working to keep everybody happy. Those come with their own set of cash flow challenges in between um, projects. And, you know, if somebody doesn't want to extend, you might have to raise and replace them. So you save, you know, so you save that, uh, that relationship, but all of that energy and effort is pulling away from the actual value that you're working to create as a company. So that's mm -hmm. at the moment, I'd say that's been probably our biggest challenge. We've, we've made it through the construction world. We feel good about that. And now we just need to make sure that we're uh, we've got a nice kind of reset with uh, with some new capital. I love it. Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, because you guys have done a significant volume of transactions with investors, uh, has there been a situation where things haven't worked out as planned or, you know, you, you got into a deal and, you know, it just didn't go the way you had expected it to. Um, we've all experienced that. How have you dealt with that? And more importantly, um, how have you shared that with the investors that were involved and what, what came out of that? Yeah. Um, so 
those were that that was that was a, that was a scary and hard time. You know, the the nice thing is is that in these types of projects, you don't you can be surprised by the the cost of a, a change order, but at the end of the day, you can really start to see what's my bottom line going to be, and you can project uh, as you get closer. So, yep. you know, a couple months out before we were really across the finish line. And we realized there was a couple of projects that we were just going to lose money on. Um, and it was, you know, we, we came out of our hell portfolio losing about half a million dollars of mm -hmm. capital that we did not have because we raised it all. Right. So, you know, the, and the answer was you told the truth. Uh, so I had, I called three investors that we had good relationships with that were effectively across, you know, could make up that difference. And I invited them out each individually to lunch. And I had to, I sat there and I said, you know, Marty, Marty is a great investor. He's still a current investor with us. Love him to right. death. And um, Marty's like, I had a feeling something bad was coming considering uh, I don't drink anymore. And you asked me to meet you at a bar. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh God, Marty, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I sat down with him and I said, look, uh, we've honestly gotten our teeth kicked in by this contractor. Here's the steps of, of how we've gotten here. Um, and the truth is, I'm going to sell this building and I'm going to lose money and I'm not going to be able to pay you back. And he was like, okay, so what happens next? And I said, well, truthfully, I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this business. Uh, I don't want to learn my lessons and then quit. That doesn't make sense. I don't want to learn my lessons and go bankrupt. I want to learn my lessons and I want to approve. And I said, Marty, at the time, I don't even have the next project on how I'm going to pay you back. I don't know what that is, but... Mm. I kind of need you to take a leap of faith with me and believe in me that I'm, I'm going to take care of you because at the end of the day, we're as good as our word. And, and that's really what I have right now. And he said, I really, I did that conversation two more times. And all of those investors said, thank you so much for the transparency, the honesty, and all of them actually reinvested more money into our next wave <laughs> of developments. Uh, and then we use those wave of developments to effectively pay down that, that $500,000 hole. Uh, with mm -hmm. the new knowledge that we had. So yeah, we've, 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 we've taken L's, we've been put through the ringer. Uh, but at the end of the day is you just, you have to have the grit and the resilience and the perseverance to get through the hard time. And uh, at the end of the day, you're, you're working with people's nest eggs. Um, you know, right. people have worked a long time to get you that hundred thousand dollars. You know, I'm talking about 50 and hundred thousand dollar investors. Like they, you know, somehow at this volume, they don't become less significant. They're just as significant as the quarter million dollar check. Uh, it just might have, you know, they might have taken 20 years to get there. So we've always kept that in the back of our mind uh, to do right by the people and the stakeholders that invest with us. But honesty is the best policy. It always has been. I couldn't endorse that more. You know, it's really amazing how many business owners, it's not just real estate, it's literally just people that have raised money that have that responsibility when something does not go as planned or they sense that they may lose the investor's capital. They try to sweep it under the rug and not talk about it. And they start going dark and ghosting the calls and not returning them. And man, that's the biggest way to end up in trouble. It's the biggest way to burn bridges and, and lose relationships. You know, I was in the oil business for many years. And um, in that business, there is always the risk of drilling a dry hole. And, you know, you're spending hundreds of thousands, in many cases, a million dollars plus, you drill the well, and you come back and the results show there's just nothing there. And so you have to go back to investors. And I equate it to a doctor walking out of the operating room and bowing a set and having to approach a family and saying we did everything we could, but unfortunately, we couldn't save them. You know, that's tough, but uh, professionals do what they need to do. And the funny thing is, much like what you saw in the story you just shared, people will invest again. And I actually had a lot of people that would do that. And when I just confronted them and said, you know, I just lost your money. And, uh, you know, to me, it's a lot of money, $100,000. You know, why would you re-up and commit to invest again with us? It always came down to, Brad, you're transparent. We know you're honest. We know it's not you. It's just one of the risks involved in the industry we're in. But we know that perhaps on the next one we'll hit and the oil that's found will certainly make up for the loss on the prior. It's a numbers game. And I've learned a lesson there that I still use today. And that is the honesty, the transparency, and just really communication with your investors is so very important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
One question that I wanted to just kind of visit is, you know, when I talk to partnerships, which are largely the two of you, um, the burden of raising capital sometimes falls on one person's shoulders and the operational side of the business perhaps falls more on somebody else's. Uh, in the way that you guys have structured your business, are you both involved in the capital raising or does it really fall more on one of you than the other? Can you maybe elaborate on that and how you go about working with investors? Sure. Um, Here. Yeah, sure. I'll take this. Uh, I would say uh, yes to both of your uh, your perspectives there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, um, we do both raise capital. Um, you know, I'm not a, the partner that sort of sits in the dark and lets Alex be the, the complete face of the company um, as much as he deserves it more than me. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, so, yeah, we, we do both raise capital. We are both involved. Um, it's such a huge component of our business. Um, you know, we sort of like are at the same level of the hierarchy in the company. And so it's important for us to both, I think, uh, have a face to show, you know, as we talk about each other and, and the partnership. Um, but it definitely does uh, appeal more to Alex's strengths uh, as and his preferences as a, as a business owner and salesperson. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mind doing it, but I tend to lean a little bit more, I think, into the operations and the uh, and the management of a lot of the back end stuff, which I kind of you know prefer to sit in my nice cozy office and have fun at my computer all day. Um, so Alex likes to be out and about, meeting people, shaking hands. So um, there 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 is some separation there, but also both contributions. And Alex certainly contributes a lot to the operations. And you know mm -hmm. we have a lot going on, and we have a really lean team, so we're willing to wear whatever hat is necessary for the day. Really what happened, really what happened, Brad, is, you know, there used to be a third partner. We won't mention his name. That'll be for the book. Um, so, you know, when he, when we, there, the three of us uh, were together, that, that guy was, was our systems guy. And, and he really loved being, you know, the holder of, of the puppets, if you will. And, um, you know, we were probably working at, we were projecting this level of, uh, of, of scale and professionalism, which is great to have and we were working to implement these systems which were great um theoretically you know all the great books and whatnot um but we just weren't that good yet as operators and we were proof of that in our first <laughs> portfolio so after that happened our, our third partner decided he no longer wanted to be part of of the company so harrison and i for some reason, let him off the hook uh, effectively. And Harrison and I got us out of the mess. But after going through that entire debacle, we said to ourselves, we're like, all right, we need to ditch some of the structure we have and we need to move as a unit and we need to tag team everything together. And we mm -hmm. need to give two minds to one task. And we effectively went the complete opposite direction of you know, trying to... Uh, give away responsibility uh we took on as much responsibility as possible uh mm -hmm. so that went you know that was everything from the construction management and the permit oversight to harrison learning how to read formal building plans and communicate yep. with engineers and architects to managing all of our apartments internally in-house uh mm -hmm. so as we've kind of gotten to this new level now naturally new structure new systems are just coming back into the business as a, as, a, as a form of necessity at a certain level. But since 2018, 2019, we effectively did everything together uh, mm -hmm. for the business. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important point is I always talk about how important it is when you're speaking to an investor about showing them the transparency to your team, because at the end of the day, um, any investor you're communicating with, and we actually uh, hosted Shark Tank's Kevin Harrington at our event a few years ago, and this was his big message to everybody. He's like, look, you know, as everybody knows who's ever watched the show Shark Tank, we have a lot of people that come onto that show that are brilliant. They got PhDs, they're doctors, they're engineers, and, you know, they got a great product or whatever it is they're doing. But at the end of the day, they leave the show and not a single shark has backed them. And um, it's not the person. It's the fact that when we look at them and we look at what they're trying to accomplish, 
the big key word is execution. And a lot of people that are trying to go out and attract and raise capital, they come across to that potential investor as a solopreneur. It's like, I look at you, dude, and you're spinning all the damn plates. Like, you know, do you have a team behind you? And it's so important that, you know, you guys have built the team, like you mentioned, where, you know, yes, there is an attorney we work with. And yes, there is an accounting firm that we work with. And yes, there are professionals behind uh, both of us that we work with. Because now, when you're having a conversation with a potential investor, they realize that the execution ability is there. And while it's not guaranteed, it provides more certainty and allows me to move forward and feel more comfortable in ultimately making that decision. 100% agree with that. You know, as you guys have grown and, and scaled your business, uh, I'm assuming that when you largely got started with the first couple of investors, the infrastructure uh, and maybe the systems and structures that you have in place today have largely changed. Uh, you know, you start realizing, holy shit, there's something actually called investor relations. And holy crap, at the end of the year, the people we work with expect to get their tax reporting documentation. How have things evolved for you since you got started? And what does that infrastructure look for, like for you today uh, that maybe wasn't there, you know, three or four years ago? Yeah, that's that's an exciting question. I would like to answer that one, Harrison. So Please. in the in the in the beginning and uh, Truthfully, we're still very much so to our- Probably working on so the post-it notes like a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in, and in very many ways, we're still, we're still in very much in touch with our, our grassroots approach. So in the, in the very beginning, I had read a book by Than Merrill and you know he was talking about um, pre-selling your house flips and creating a little website and then blogging about the progress of your property and putting that on. And then, you know, that way the people in the neighborhood can go to, you know, one, two, three, uh, mainstreet.com and look at the progress of your project. So yeah. Yeah. one thing I told you, Brad, very beginning, uh, super coachable. If someone says, do something, this works, we will do it. So that is effectively what we started doing. And if you go to our website, we've actually been blogging since 2016 on our company mm -hmm. website. You can see Harrison with long hair, <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, so we were sending out these, you know, bi-weekly updates on our website that people could see, and they were very low brow. It's just here's some photos. Here's what we did. We met with the carpenters. How exciting! Um, and people were just, you know, a lot of the times, once people trusted you that the big picture was going to work, work itself through, and then they got those consistent updates that you were actively involved in the business, even if it wasn't financially reporting. It, there was no sophistication to the way that we communicated. It was just, we're in front of you, we're in front of you, we're in front of you, here's pictures. People loved that. And we started our own YouTube channel where we started a Wallace and Wednesday segment called Wally Wednesdays. And then we yep. were rolling those out and people loved that. And we really, you know, through and, and still very much so until very recently, we would, you know, just offshore the the, the tax prep and the accounting prep and, and other professionals. And we would link our uh, investors with those members of our, of our business. And we just kept our, uh, our execution at a much more kind of rudimentary level, but it worked so well for us. And people just loved seeing our videos and our pictures and our blogs. And mm. now, now that we've grown and, you know, we've got 160 doors across uh, 16 buildings, half of them are in development you outgrow that level. You need to outgrow that and you need to become more sophisticated. So since we manage everything, we love the control of everything. We're actually building our own property technology um, platform. That's got some really attractive proprietary uh, features that we are building to solve our own issues, which is really high end detailed reporting for our investors, as well as full transparency across different stages of our building process this property technology solution will encompass everything from higher levels of transparency and service for our tenants. So we're now building this, 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 uh, this piece of property technology to solve and make our lives easier. And I'm actually really excited, Brad, to share this with you in the next couple of weeks, because I actually think what we're building to solve our own business issues 
uh, will have phenomenal market impact for the future. And, you know, we're solving our problems in challenging neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. we realize this, some, some of the stuff that we're building, other people might be able to use, but at minimum, our investors and our stakeholders and our tenants are just going to absolutely love the new level of service that we're able to provide at a scalable, at a scalable way. Mm, love it. You know, in any partnership, when you have two people working together, um, there's always going to be circumstances and situations where there's button heads, disagreements. You both don't come to terms or see things the same way. Um, how have you guys been able to stay together, uh, not only as partners, but also buddies for such an extended period of time in a business? And I'm sure in a relationship where there's probably been some disagreement over some things, you know, um, is it, you know, playing rock, paper, scissors, or do you have another process in place to kind of work through the challenges of being a team versus just being a solopreneur uh, how do you guys deal with that conflict that every now and then just does come up uh in any business where you have more than one cook in the kitchen That's uh, uh, yeah <laughs> i'll be much more generous <laughs> <laughs> the big guy always wins <laughs> um you know, uh, harrison I'll... stands up and he's six four and alex stands up he's five ten big guy always wins no i'm just kidding <laughs> That's uh, why I wear collared shirts and he gets away with car parts. <laughs> yeah, he'll whip my ass. I'm just kidding. Alex almost had one physical altercation with me and that was the last one, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> a little arm wrestling there. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, now we're going on, what are we, eight, eight years in business together or so. And, um, you know, the, the earlier years, our relationship wasn't as solid as it is now, for sure. And certainly over the past uh four has probably been the best and i think you know some of that can be attributed to like obviously we were much younger eight years ago than we were than we are now you know we were 24 25 now both into our early 30s and you know sort of life changes and you and you tend to grow up a bit more personally anyway um so that's contributed to probably more of our you know success as far as like not having a, a really a ton of issues between us over the latter half of our relationship Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I think we've always been just really good at maintaining the common, like our common goal and that we know that anything that either of us says or does is in pursuit of that. And mm -hmm. so even if I'm sure I say or do things that rub Alex the wrong way, and sometimes he may communicate it to me, sometimes he may not, um, and vice versa. Um, sometimes he may say or do things that rub me the wrong way, and I, maybe I communicate it, maybe I don't. Sure. Yeah. But I think really at the end of the day, we both know that it's for the same common good, like goal. Like we are, I mean, we are like deep in our business together um, mm -hmm. and have been for a while. And, um, you know, we know that the success of that uh, is, and, and especially when, you know, we've raised, you know, obviously we've raised a lot of outside capital and we feel a lot of responsibility and duty to the investors that, uh, have financially joined us in this. Uh, it really, you know, we know that we're always doing or saying, or whatever we're doing, we believe is for the advance of that. Um, so that has, I think really, especially more in, in the latter half now, um, uh, not that the first half was bad by any means, but it's just, you know, even better um, because we've, we've continued to grow the business. And so that also just grows our relationship and keeps that vision really clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's, that's great. You wanted to yeah, comment that, on that as well? Yeah, that's, that's, that was sweet, Harrison. Thank you. And, you know, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think something else that is really kind of fortified us is, is two things we became friends because we were both high performers in a previous organization. We both rose to become general managers and high performers. So, you know, that kind of removes the level uh, that, that puts us on another play, uh, a level already. And then, you know, I told you about the original um, member of our team when he decided to quit um, Harrison did not. And I did not. So we kind of built this really strong bond by getting out of a mess that somebody else helped create and didn't help clean up. You know, that relationship, 
that person I also was also a high performer in our previous organization and we were we were all best friends and then after you made that decision it was uh, it almost it felt like a a character change um and then that relationship is actually it, 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 I wouldn't even call it good anymore and Harrison yeah. and I were kind of forged through fire getting through that together and I think just that kind of level of trust and commitment to each other you can get over the the nonsense that you know pisses you off because mm -hmm. well we worked together for three years and we didn't make any money and we paid people off and we did the right thing but we did it together so I think that is really what's you know that that's what's hardened us as as a as a team yeah yeah that's really really good you know since you both have been involved now for a number of years on lots of projects and also raising capital um what would you say now that you have much more knowledge of the process uh, is maybe the single most important skill or maybe, you know, the, the one or two single most important skills that somebody needs to bring to the table to be a successful capital raiser? Uh, because ultimately, that's a good part of what the Capital Catalyst Show is all about. It's really empowering people and uh, getting them to understand uh, the OPM game, what would you say maybe it's the top one or two skills or traits that somebody has to have to be successful at capital raising? Yeah, I th that's a great question. And honestly, it's a very challenging question, but I can absolutely without a, uh, any doubt say that you've got to have the grit and the perseverance mm -hmm. to get yourself in front of people. Uh, you know, Harrison and I would get lists and we would create lists and then we would hire assistants and we would, we would contact those lists. And we've probably sent, you know, over 10,000 emails. That's a lot of, that's a lot of energy and effort to get in front of people. And yeah. sure, maybe you, you know, you close up a hundred out of that 10,000. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that's a small return, but we hired somebody else to send the 10,000 emails. Um, so at the end of the day, this really is not to, you know, quote Grant Cardone, but it's a, it's a contact sport. And the more people you contact, the better luck you're going to have raising capital at the end of the day. I love that. Yeah. It's truly getting knocked down, getting back up and realizing it's like climbing a mountain. It's just one foot in front of the other showing up every day, um, doing the things that we know we should be doing. But at the end of the day, a lot of times we just don't want to do them. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of people out there want to get six pack abs. They know that they should be going to a fitness center, but they don't go uh, for many reasons. But again, I think it's understanding why you're doing what it is you're doing and understanding more importantly that going through those motions are ultimately moving you closer to that goal. And, you know, you'll get a lot of no's and a lot of I need to think about it's and a lot of people procrastinating and putting you off. But having the vision and really knowing what other people's money can do and how it can accelerate the process of wealth creation in your life uh, is ultimately the most important thing. It's the target that, you know, we're going for knowing that getting there is going to be real challenging and real tough, but we're so committed to that process and to that target that, uh, you know, we'll go to hell and back in order to get there. And I think yeah. it's kind of, I think it's kind of like a snowball going down a mountain in the beginning. It's very slow. It's hard. You have to push yeah. it. You have to pack it yourself, but you know, with, with consistency, time is your ally. And it yes. takes a little bit of time to get the ball rolling, to kind of feel good in the momentum of something that you're building for yourself. The beginning is always the hardest. And then once you start to pick up that steam, as long as you can keep one foot in front of each other and, and you know, keep it between the buoys, um, if you keep going, you're going to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it, it gets easier because you get your database of investors that now know, like, and love you. And uh, the larger that database becomes, the easier it ultimately gets to raise capital on ensuing deals or if you launch a fund. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, these people will re-up, they have discretionary income or they just got a lot of wealth. Uh, and then it's just a matter of, you know, outreach. Uh, many of the people that we have in our community, it's like, hell, you know, they're raising $6 million, $8 million like in a week, 10 days. Email goes out, people raise their hand. 
they get the soft commitments done and they can go and close with certainty. But like you've said, it didn't start that way. <laughs> you know, it, it probably started like it has for most with 150,000 and 140,000. And then a couple of weeks later, another, and you, you just slowly build that momentum where you go from one investor to three to 10. And, you know, by keeping at it and putting that one foot and forward in front of the other, you finally look back over a year, 18 months, you're like, holy crap, we got 40 investors now. And collectively we've raised whatever numbers of millions of dollars that that happens to be. Uh, and like you said, time becomes your friend. You know, time becomes your friend. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank both of you guys for taking time out of your day. Harris and Alex, been a great episode. You've shared a lot of information, a lot of golden nuggets in this. For our listeners out there that are part of our listening audience, I want to thank you for listening to another fantastic episode of the Capital Catalyst Show. Check back frequently for future episodes where we host entrepreneurs, business owners, other professionals that have mastered the art of using other people's money to scale their businesses, and most importantly, to build that wealth. This is Brad Blazer thanking you so much for showing up. And by the way, if you did like this episode, become a subscriber or better yet, Click the little link below the episode and give us a like, give us a comment, give us a shout out. Uh, Harrison and Alex, you quickly want to let our listeners know maybe how they can follow you or how they can learn more about what you're doing before we end the session. Absolutely. Uh, we are. So we are Wollaston Real Estate Investments uh, mm -hmm. at Wollaston Real Estate Investments on all the social medias. Uh, at Wollaston, W-O-L-L-A-S-T-O-N-R-E-I. Uh, on Instagram. That's our website. Uh, and if someone wanted to email us, it would be just uh, for myself, Harrison uh, and Alex at wallistonrei.com. There you go. Follow these guys. They're doing big things, everybody. You'll learn a lot about real estate, about raising capital. This is Brad Blazer saying we'll see you at the next episode. Stay tuned. Keep motivated and more importantly, realize that capital raising is not as difficult or challenging as you might think it can be. Why? Because we get people each and every week that are on our show that show you it can be done. This is Brad Blazer saying we'll see you at the next episode of the Capital Catalyst Show. And thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to the Capital Catalyst Show with Brad Blazer the best place for entrepreneurs interested in doing something big in life, having considerably less stress and a more balanced life. Go to bradblazer.com for more ways to accelerate your success.